it's so good to see you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, if you're joining us online, just super glad that you're here worshiping with us today. Today, we're going to be finishing up our series, Add To. And uh, what you're going to notice is that um, is that we hopped over a couple, and the reason we're hopping over a couple of the virtues that Peter that Peter lists is because we want to get to our Christmas series, which is Ruth. And Ruth is a book in the Old Testament, but everything about Ruth, even in the Old Testament, points to Jesus in the New. And so we're going to be spending some time uh, with Ruth. And so we're going to we're going to jump over and, and uh, we're going to finish up Add Two today. But before we get to that, I'd just quickly say, here's what I'm excited about. Over the past like eight weeks, over the past nine weeks, as a church, we've been able to focus on two passages: Romans 12, 1 and two, and Second Peter chapter one, verses three through eleven. And we focus on those two those two passages to point the church in a specific direction of what it looks like and what it means to be the church. Like these two passages, Romans 12. 12, 1 and 2, and 2 Peter 1, 3, 3 through 11, this is what it looks like to be the church. And even in 2018, like if, if we will not just read these verses, if we'll actually apply them to our lives, we will be the church that Christ always envisioned us to be. And that is why we're going through this series. I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for me. I'm excited for us that, that God would one of the things I was thinking for him was for his word so that we can know his word and that we can live his word out. And so uh, today we'll wrap up Add To, uh, which we'll just say it together one last time. I know it's your favorite part of the service where you get to say this, where we don't put the words up on the screen because I know that you have it memorized, and so here's what I would tell you. If you have it memorized, you let it rip. If you have pockets of it memorized, let it rip. If you don't have any of it, don't try don't try. Just, just look in sheer amazement at the person next to you who has this and just be in awe of that for a minute because God, uh, in his own goodness, man, his, it's his divine power who has given us everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us according to his glory and according to his goodness. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises. Okay, man, listen, you guys are the first ones to get back... Everybody else left me out on an island. Thank you, man. I heard that. That's awesome. And listen, when we, when we get into God's word, it is so easy to just skim through. It's so easy to just fly through and miss some real good stuff. And we just potentially miss some real good stuff. Because what Peter just told us is, is that God has given us everything we need for a godly life. And that he's given us very great and precious promises. So it's not going to come up on your outline, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to write down your outline. Here's your homework this week. I want you to go through scriptures and I want you to discover what are those great and precious promises that God has given to us. Because he's given us those promises. What are they? I bet you know some of them. But I want, you to, I want you to mine the scriptures for those great and precious promises. This is a good deal. God has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us according to his glory and goodness. That through these, he's given us very great and precious promises. It keeps getting better than that. So that through these great and precious promises, I, I guarantee some of us have missed it. Through these very great and precious promises, we might participate in his divine nature. Whoa. What does that mean? Did you know that you get to participate in his divine nature? Do you know that God is so good that you get to participate in his divine nature? Let me tell you, what does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. That means you walked in here today with a hurt. That means that hurt does not own you. Somebody walked in here with a habit, a habit that's gotten you from the inside out. And what that means is that habit does not own you. You have not been mastered by that habit because Jesus has set you free. That's what it means to participate in his divine nature. Some of us got some hang-ups. Some of us got some stuff going on in our lives. And what I tell you, some of us got some sin issues going on in our lives. And that sin does not own you. That's what it means to participate in his divine nature. But it only gets better from there. Because God, in his goodness, chooses to make his dwelling inside his own followers. Did you know that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that his spirit lives inside of you? Dude, hold the phone. Like God hasn't given you a spirit of fear and timidity. He's given you one of power and love and self-discipline. That's some good divine nature stuff. And we just look at divine nature like he's going to let us participate in his divine nature. We're going to live forever. Okay. 
Did you get that? You're going to get to live forever in the way that God fashioned and dreamed about when he made you? That you would be with him in a place where there's no sadness, no sickness, no suffering, and no death? That there's only joy, and there's only peace, and there's only love? And you get that through Jesus? Like Peter's telling us some big time stuff of what it means to participate in his divine nature. But then he's not done because he goes on in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 11. He says this, so that through these, you get to participate in his divine nature and that through them, we get to escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. He's telling us the clock is ticking on this life. The clock is ticking on this world, but you are going to get to exceed the life expectancy of this place if you participate in a relationship with God. That is unbelievable. I mean, we should get back that ax thing out again right now because I bet our prayers would be a whole lot different and maybe even better because of all the good things that God has given us. So not only do you get that, and then, then Peter says, okay, that's what God has done for us. Now, you have a role in this. Like, you follower of Jesus, you have a role in this. He says, so therefore, make every effort. What kind of effort? To add to, everybody say add to. Make every effort to add to your faith. This is, this is it. This is a home run pitch. Make sure you make every, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, and to knowledge, and to self-control, and to perseverance. Godliness and the godliness. Dude, have you guys had coffee this morning? <laughs> I may have had too much. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. And the godliness and a mutual affection. For if you possess these in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your faith. Make every effort to add this list of virtues because your effectiveness in your faith, your productivity in your faith, ride on this very thing. And if we don't possess them, it only proves that we're nearsighted and that we're blind, having forgotten that we have been cleansed from our sins. And then Peter comes back again and he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election so that you will not stumble and that you will see, receive a rich welcome into our kingdom of, into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So today, we're going to look at the final two virtues that Peter lists. The add to. We're going to add to our faith mutual affection and love. Add to our faith mutual affection and love. Mutual affection, if I can just put it this way, it is unity. Think unity. That we're going to be unified in love, think the way that God has loved you. That's called agape love. That's called unconditional love. That's called grace. That's called mercy. Listen, God's love is good, not because you were so easy to love or I was so easy to love, but because he is love and he is that good. And in fact, didn't Jesus say in John, I think it's John chapter 13, how, did the, how is the world gonna know that we belong to him? How we... Oh man, so what Peter's talking about is a big deal. You see this mutual affection and love, this thing that Peter's talking about to us in 2 Peter, it's like the core DNA of a follower of Jesus. This is like how we live this out is absolutely paramount because if we get this right, if we add to our faith, if today you will add to your faith, if you'll make an effort, every effort to add to your faith, mutual love, or sorry, mutual affection and love, here's what's gonna happen. If you'll add that in all the other lists, people will see Jesus in you. You see, this is a really big deal because Jesus said, this is how the world is going to know that you're mine. And I don't know how you come at those two words, mutual affection and love, but when I read those, like if you just gave me a Bible and said, Mike, I want you to read these today, and I got to mutual affection and love, here's the tape playing in my head when I get to mutual affection and love. We're all arm in arm walking through a mountain field of lilies on our way home. It's gonna be epic. It'll be euphoric. We're all gonna always get along and it's gonna be easy. I've got this preconceived idea that it's gonna be easy and it's gonna be awesome as Jesus and we'll all just skip together as we go through the mountain fields. <clears throat> but when you really dig down on that, if, we, if, if mutual affection matters, 
then we have to embrace the uniqueness of how God has made each and every one of us. And in order to do that, that's probably gonna get messy. But I got this preconceived idea that it should be easy. If we're going to love others the way that Christ loved us, it's probably gonna be difficult. It's gonna be hard. But that's what we've been called to do. I want you to take any preconceived ideas that you have about this, and I, I just I want you to throw them out because we got preconceived ideas about a lot of things. Some of us have preconceived ideas, um, which is basically an idea of what you think should happen or is going to happen, and it doesn't even have to be based on reality. Like I look out and I see some of my young friends who are here today, and you're like, one day I'm going to get a job and I'm going to be wealthy beyond all imagination. That's your preconceived idea, and then taxes and bills and parents kick you out of the nest and you got to pay for that thing too and man what happened some of us today walked in here we have a preconceived idea that uh if I had a certain car or if I had if I was in a relationship with a certain somebody my life would be complete some of us have a preconceived idea that if you didn't have to work with the people that you worked with you'd be better at your job or you would have more fun at your job it's not your fault it's their fault have a preconceived idea that way some of us have preconceived ideas that uh, when you go out to eat after church today, that the wait staff is going to be so excited you showed up, that they were waiting for you to get there. You walked in and all of a sudden they heard angels sing, oh, they're finally here. And man, they've been waiting for you to get there. And then you sit and you make your order and it's nothing like it was on the menu, but you order because they're so excited to serve you. This is your preconceived idea. And then what you think is, man, that food is going to come out at perfect temperature. It's going to look better than I thought it would. It's going to taste better than I thought it would. And what happens in a restaurant when that does no, when your preconceived idea is not met? It gets messy, doesn't it? The same thing happens in the church. If you think that love and mutual affection is gonna be easy and we're running through mountain flowers together, your preconceived idea is gonna to totally get things messy because we're messy and to love people like Jesus loved us is gonna take real hard work. And I went through a part of my adult life where I just thought that this is how it should be and then I really started paying attention to scripture. If you start paying attention to scripture, if you go to like Matthew chapter 20, you're gonna find this epic moment because the disciples are on the road. They're traveling with Jesus. And here's John. John is right up next to Jesus and he starts talking about Jesus' kingdom. Man, wouldn't Jesus love to talk about his kingdom? John thinks to himself. So he's like, Jesus, hey, when your kingdom comes, I know you had to pick these other dudes, but you really wanted me. Can you just make sure that like I'm right next to you in your kingdom so people can see me? And one of the other 11 dudes heard him talking. They're like, what'd you just say to him? Oh, nothing. And then John's mom speaks up. No, no, he was telling Jesus that he wants to be right next to him in the kingdom when his kingdom comes in. It got messy. The disciples started infighting right there on the road. You see, loving each other the way that Jesus loved us, mutual affection and unity is gonna take real hard work. If you go further in your Bible, if you read past the disciples, you get to a passage in Acts chapter 15. You've heard of super apostle Paul. Well, he was going out on these missionary journeys with a guy named Barnabas. Do you know what the name Barnabas means? It means son of encouragement. His entire essence of who he is is to encourage others. Hey man, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. What can I do to help you? Oh, hey, I'm sorry to hear this is happening in your life. Would it be okay if I stopped and prayed for you? This is Barnabas. Barnabas, hey, how can I encourage you? How can I serve you? And if you read in Acts chapter 15, you see that Paul and Barnabas got in a sharp argument. Do you know what sharp argument means? That's an epic throwdown. How do you get in an argument with the dude whose name means son of encouragement? And you both love Jesus, and yet it still happened. Let me tell you how it happened. You put a feeler in a room with a non-feeler. The feeler wasn't feeling heard. The non-feeler thought the feeler was absolutely insane and ludicrous and crazy, and it just got all kinds of sideways and messed up. I mean, don't you wish that God made people who thought and felt just like you do? It'd make life easier, wouldn't it? But that's not what he's called us to do. He's made us different on purpose but it got messy. 
And so whatever preconceived ideas that you have about what love and mutual affection should be like and feel like, I just want you to know that it's going to take real hard work. And here's what I would tell you, that if we will live this out, it will produce a faith in us that produces a love that shows. A faith that grows is going to produce a love that shows. But as these guys, and, and then going back to what we were talking about, how this love and mutual affection thing, what I would tell you guys is as you read through scriptures, it didn't keep followers of Jesus from fighting. Mutual affection and love did not keep followers of Jesus from fighting, but you know what it did do? It gave them something to fight for. It gave them something to live for. Mutual affection and love gave these guys something to live for. You know what they were living for? They were living for the kingdom. They were living for Jesus Christ. They're like, man, dude, you really chap me right now. Mm, I need some mutual affection. Mm, I need some love. It gave them something to live for. Because Jesus says, the way you love one another is the way the world is gonna know that you're mine. It's gonna be the way that the world knows that I exist and that I am inside of you. This is a really big deal. Mutual affection and love is a really big deal because it's gonna show that we belong to Jesus. Let me tell you, mutual love and affection may not keep us from fighting but it'll give us something to live for, to fight for. Unity and love for one another. Mutual affection and love, those are the two reasons, those are the two reasons you never quit the church and go to another one. Oh, stepping on somebody's toes now. It's the reason you don't pack your bags and get angry. It's the reason you say, oh, I'm not getting what I need. It's the reason you don't say, oh man, I don't like what he said or she said or what they did. Hey, somebody hurt me. I quit. I'm going somewhere else. Mutual affection, proving to the world that God's love exists inside of you is way too important for you to have your feelings hurt to the point you quit. Do you want to really have the conversation and say, you know what, God, they hurt me. I quit. I'm going to a different place. Do you want to tell God that? Because he never said you quit the church. What did he say? You love one another the way Christ has loved you. You love mutual affection. You live for unity. You fight for unity. You don't quit on one another. But see, it's so easy in our culture. We throw away, our, we throw away relationships with our friends. We throw away relationships with our spouses. We throw away our relationships in the church because somebody hurt us. Let me remind you what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not become so well-adjusted to culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Let me tell you what our culture says. Our culture says, start over, because it's easier. It's easier for me to quit on you than have a hard conversation with you. It's easier for me to quit on you than love you. It's easier for me to quit on you than have mutual affection and love towards you. It's easy for me to start over with somebody else. I will tell you that most, one of the most terrifying conversations that takes place in my life, people come to me and say, Mike, I'm going to a different church. I was like, dude, don't do it, man, because you're painting a picture. And here's what I tell you. There are seasons. There are seasons. But if you're leaving because you're hurt or somebody else hurt you, that is not a good enough reason. If somebody did something sinful, if there's something that is, that is blasphemous, okay, all right, you should leave. Or, but go talk to them first. Go talk to them about it. Maybe there's something just slipped out. Maybe something just happened. But mutual affection and love is way too important. And when you quit on people, when you quit on the church, you are sending a message to the rest of the world. Hey, man, love is conditional, dude. Is that how Jesus loved us? No, he, lived us, he loved us unconditionally. This is the reason mutual affection and love is the reason you don't church shop. Here's another conversation that freaks me out. It's when somebody comes to me and goes, man, I have never felt loved like I did when I came here today. The first thought that goes through my head is, dear God, don't let that be true. Because if that is true, what you're telling me is you've been going to a church for an awfully long time and nobody has ever loved you like Jesus and I'm so sorry. But the second thought right behind it is this one. Please don't put that pressure on me and please don't put that pressure on my friends out here because we will fail you miserably. Find a church that you believe in their mission and you believe what they're about that preaches gospel, that preaches 
Jesus that makes him the, the subject of affection, the model to follow. You find that church and you sit your butt down and you hunker in for the long haul because you're going to get your feelings hurt. It's just going to happen. Guess what? God gave us all these different personalities. And he gives us all these different ways and we come into this room together pursuing love and mutual affection that we really wish would feel good. And guess what? It is good. It will feel good, but sometimes it's going to get messy. Mutual affection and love is the reason when we tell you to go find a group, especially you guests, don't look for the perfect group. Because once you get there, you'll screw it up. That's what happened when I went to mine anyway. I found this perfect group. And then I screwed it up because I'm not perfect. But the beautiful thing is I found out that they were screwed up too. It's this place where you're known. It's like this place where you let the walls down and you don't like put this perfect facade up. You're like, hey, let me tell you what I'm praying about. Let me tell you what I'm struggling with. Let me tell you what I'd really like to do. Let me tell you what I'd really like to say. And then you let them bear with you and you let them forgive you and you let them love on you. You let them encourage you. And when you do this, people see and they experience Jesus and we're identified as his when we add to our faith mutual affection and love. And not just these two, but all of them. You see, this is a really big deal, this idea of adding to our faith mutual love and affection. So how do you add these things to your faith? Well, the first two aren't going to come up on your, up on your note page, but I would encourage you to write them down. I think the first thing we have to do is I think we have to pray for it. Because that's what Jesus prayed about. Hours before he's going to be arrested, hours before he's going to be handed over, Jesus enters into this, this moment of prayer. And he could have prayed for absolutely anything, but do you know who he prayed for? He prayed for us. He, he, he prayed, Lord, I pray for all of those who would believe in us. I pray for all of those who would believe in me. Pray for all of them for all time. And I pray that they would be one as we are one. What did Jesus pray for? He prayed for mutual affection. He prayed for unity. He prayed for love. Those are the things that the Son of God, hours before he purchased our freedom on Calvary, that's what he prayed for. So do you know what that tells me? If that's not in our prayer life, it needs to go in starting this afternoon. Because if we've got any shot in mutual affection, if we've got any shot in loving one another the way that Christ loved us, it is going to require prayer. It is gonna require prayer for one another. It is gonna require prayer on our behalf. Lord, help me do it. Because without you, I can't. But I would remind you that Peter says, God's power has given us everything we need Everything we need for a godly life. God has given us everything we need to love people the way that Christ loved us. He's already given it to you. We just got to step into it. He's given us everything we need for unity. He shows us the picture. He shows us what it's all about. He says, you just got to live in it. We should pray for it. If Jesus is praying for it, we need to pray for it. We need to pray for one another. You see, mutual affection and love is a really big deal. It's how we'll be known. And I'll tell you just one more thing about mutual affection and love. It is such a big deal. It is the reason the church polices gossip itself. Because when we gossip about somebody, we are cutting the church off at the knees. They're like, that doesn't look like Jesus. Jesus never did that. And that's why we say, hey, we can't have this conversation. We don't play for that team. We play for the unity team. We play for the, the, the way Jesus loves team. So when that happens, stop it. Cut it off right there. It's the reason that we're willing to confront somebody, not for moral high ground, but for the sake of the God's church. But we gotta pray for that. We gotta pray for that for one another. We gotta pray for, pray for that um, for ourselves. The other thing that we need to do is, again, the example that Jesus set is he loved us. Is he loved us. He loved us. If we've got any shot at mutual affection and love, we need to love one another the way that Christ has loved us. Do you know what that means? 
we can't run any churches down in town. We can't compare this church to any other church. You see, those churches, and let me just start naming them, First Baptist, Hope Church, Restoration Church, the Fort Ministry, those are our brothers and sisters. If we got any shot in mutual affection, if we got any shot at loving, loving them as Christ loved us, we have to be praying for them. We're not in competition with them. We need to love them, not compete with them. Like when I hear people come and say, like, oh, they'll tell me something, and it's typically negative about another church, I said, are you absolutely nuts? I said, I pray with those guys. I text those guys. We're on the same team. There are people whose lives literally hang in balance. Their eternity hangs in the balance. And God wants to use those same churches to reach those people. You see, if we're ever going to achieve mutual affection and love, it has to extend beyond these walls. And it has to be, be able to extend past our property borders, past our city, our city borders, past our state borders. See, we are part of a global organization called Christ Church, God's Church. And all those Christ-centered churches are our brothers and sisters that we need to be praying for. And when we mutually pursue mutual affection with them, and when we love them and pray for them and support them, we are proving to the world that we are his. And let's just be honest, we haven't been doing a very good job job. But today, because of what Peter challenges us with, we get to add to our faith mutual affection and love. So how else can we add to our faith these two things? Well, it's going to take humility. Humility, in essence, is not thinking that other people are better than you. It's just thinking of yourself less. It's putting other people's needs in front of your own needs. And the ultimate example of this, the ultimate example of this is Jesus. Because if you read Paul's words in Philippians 2, he, 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 uh, he captures the essence of humility in Jesus. So in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Instead, he humbled himself and made himself a servant unto death, death on the cross. Jesus, the Son of God, part of the Trinity, the triune God, on equal footing, did not consider equality with God the Father something to be grasped. He humbled himself, and he thought about us. And do you know how that passage starts? Your attitude should be the same that Christ Jesus had. He humbled himself. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, and he put on the nature of a servant. If we've got any real shot at adding to our faith, love, and mutual affection, we have to lead our lives with humility. And let's just get practical about that for a few minutes. I'll just pick on a whole bunch of people. I see athletes, I see young people out here today. I say, Man, you guys look good. You guys are young, you're athletic, you're winning state championships left and right. It's good to be you. You get my age, you get aches and pains. When you play on a team and you love Jesus, you want to show that team that Jesus really matters to you and compete at the highest level, you put team needs above your own. You do that simple thing and you help the team win. You do whatever the team needs you to do, even accepting a lesser role, and you are showing them the love of Jesus. I sit and I think about my, my young professional friends in this room. When you go to work for, some, for an organization, you're playing for a team. I think about the realtors out there. Man, you're playing for a team. Yeah, do you want to get the sale? You bet you do. Do people need you to help them find the house of their dreams? You bet they do. But don't forget, somebody had to go and find that house, take a picture of it, put it up online, and then you lock that sucker up like Fort Knox. You ever drive by a house for sale and you see that big thing hanging from the door? You're like, my goodness, you need to be able to bench press 200 pounds just to lift that. And then on top of that, you gotta memorize a code while you've got that? Somebody had to give you that code. Without that code, you're not getting in to show that house. You're not getting the sale. Listen, you are important in the sale of a house. You are quintessential to the sale of a house or a property, but you needed somebody else to get there. And let's just right size that thing and lead with humility. And every time you make a deal, make sure that you go and you thank somebody who helped make that thing happen to just say, hey, didn't all depend on me. 
I think about my doctor friends out there. Man, dude, we need you doctors to be excellent in every way. We show up, we are absolutely dependent on you. But don't forget, it took a scrub tech to scrub those utensils to make them clean. It took somebody to go into that OR and make sure it was a sterile and proper and prepared environment to get it done. When that surgery happens, yes, you're gonna get the credit, but don't forget, you weren't the only one who did it. You're part of a team. That's humility. Saying, hey, simple, hey man, thanks for making sure this is ready. Hey, thanks for making sure my tools are ready. Hey, I couldn't have done this without you is not too big of a statement because here's the truth. You couldn't. They did. They made it way so you could do it. Now I've picked on some professionals. Let me pick on the church world. You guys, this is not Mike Fackler's church. This is God's church. It all rises and falls on him. We're part of a team here, okay? There are, there's community group pastors. There's children's pastors. There's student ministries pastors. There's celebrate recovery pastors. There's worship pastors. If something goes down, if something goes wrong, we all feel it. It doesn't rise and fall. Not one person gets all the credit. The only one who deserves credit and who deserves praise is God and God alone. And if it works and he's praised, then glory, hallelujah. If it's not working, we will work to make sure we get better so that God can use us. Humility is a a way that you can add mutual affection and faith, or mutual affection and love to your faith. Another way you can add mutual affection and love to your faith is just, it's gonna take intentionality. Like loving somebody that is wired different than you, that feels different than you, it's gonna take intentionality because you don't get, you don't understand how they think or why they feel or what they believe, why they believe the things that they believe. You don't understand, we just, some, some things are beyond our grasp. So it's gonna take intentionality to give somebody the benefit of the doubt. And in that moment, we lead with humility, we lead with intentionality, and we say the kingdom's gotta win instead of my personal preferences. While the church would be in a lot better place in America if we were more intentional about pursuing mutual affection and love. You ever hear this thing called worship wars? Give me the hymns, baby. Give me the guitar, dude. And all of a sudden, these, pers- like these personal preferences began to outweigh what really mattered, which is praise of God. You see, it's gonna take real intentionality to lay our will and our preferences down for greater kingdom wins. It's gonna take intentionality to do that. And so if we wanna add love and mutual affection, if we got any shot of that, we're gonna have to be intentional that the kingdom wins over our personal preferences. And that, my friends, gets messy. Because what do we want to do? I want to go to my friend right there, and I want to go to my friend right there, and I'm like, I can't believe they play music like that. I can't believe he said that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe he dressed that way. I can't believe this, that, or the other. (laughs) It's going to take real intentionality. Let me help you with those two things. It's also going to take the last blank on your outline. This is going to be hard, especially for a feeler like me. You just got to believe the best in others. Now, Somebody's gonna hurt you. But there is a good chance that they didn't hurt you on purpose. Somebody's gonna wrong you, but there's probably a very good chance they didn't set out to wrong you on purpose. You're gonna have to overlook an offense. And you're gonna have to believe the best in them. If we got any shot at mutual affection, if we got any shot at you, if we got any shot at love, we're gonna have to believe the best in one another because we're different. And guess what? God designed it that way and he said that it was good and he said that it was awesome. And when we take all these uniqueness, but in the middle of it is God's love and we're committed to unity and loving others like Jesus, people will see that we belong to him. Sign me up for that. But here's what I'll tell you. I won't always get it right. And you won't always get it right either. And in those moments, let's just believe the best, that we had the best intentions. Because we always grade ourselves that we had the best intentions. Let's give everybody else the same space too. So here's what I want to challenge you to do today. I want to challenge you to live out 2 Peter Chapter 1, 3 through 11. I want to challenge you to live the add to faith. I want to challenge you to become the church that Christ 
and vision, the church that Paul planted. You see, church isn't a place that we go. It's something we become. And I want to be the type of church that Peter describes in 2 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 11. And if we will become that kind of church, then the gates of hell will never be able to prevail against it because Jesus is the one leading the charge and we're just following him. I want to encourage you to pray for your brothers and sisters around the world, the persecuted church, the church down the street, the other churches. Pray, pray and say, Lord, I'm not in competition with them. They're not bad and we're better. We're all part of one family. I'm asking you to pray for those churches. I'm asking you to pursue with all that you are love and mutual affection in the list of virtues that Peter has. Because there's a dying world out there that needs to know the greatness of God and that he is for them too. When we live it out, they see him. Jesus is visible in you. Lord, I pray we would be the church that you called us to be. I pray that you would help each and every one of us make every effort to add to our faith the list of virtues that Peter shared, especially mutual affection and love. Help us, help us lead with humility, intentionality. Help us pray for unity. God, where my Holy Spirit asks that you would remind us to do it, help us live it out. It's going to be hard. Help us, help us, help us. God, help us. God, help us. Help us be the church that you want us to be. Not known for its meeting times, but known for how, it, how we love. Not known for its meeting times, but known for how we love. God, known for how we love. We beg this, we ask this, I ask this. Help us encourage one another to live, live this out in Jesus' name. Amen.